There's a lot of counter narrative around the provision of sanitary pads, you know. Some of the counter arguments are things like, um, no, but the people who can afford sanitary pads are going to also benefit from it being zero rated. And it's like, actually, why are we centering them? They are a minority. People who can afford are a minority in South Africa. According to Stats SA, I mean, over 54% of this country is living in poverty. And this is underestimated, right? So those are not the people we should be centering in the conversation. They keep talking about all of these politicians. I mean, from the State of the Nation address of 2011, it has been mentioned as a priority, but it has never happened. So the idea is, how can this thing that you keep talking about how can we make sure it haunts you? The claims you make, you know, how can we ensure that they haunt you? Interesting to see also the alarm um, around it. So I think, you know, it's this weird thing of you have a campaign towards a particular objective, but then there's also unintended consequences, right? Where it's also about stigma. Um, the idea of, you know, periods are secret and something you should be ashamed of, you know, which is absolutely untrue. It's a natural process. So it was very really interesting to see, even in the moments when we were chasing politicians, you'd have some very conservative people who would be alarmed by, no, why are you showing this in public? Why, you know, as if it's something that should be hidden away? Yeah, and I think it really challenged a lot of people. We're very deliberate about being mobile based um, because one of the few things, South Africa is a country of many divisions, right? And, but one of the few things that we do have in common is most households have access to at least one cell phone. So while we do have an online platform, mobile is our biggest base, which would be text messages, WhatsApp, please call me, and so on. So it was just a very deliberate choice to make things available to people where they are, but also understanding that as time goes on, people will be able to access online. So we think of ourselves as when you're creating change or when you are running a campaign, right? There is no single way of doing it. You use all tools at your disposal. At the heart of the campaigns is people. What is the real world impact that people can make? What are the ways in which you can mobilize actual people and take them up the ladder of engagement? So the campaigns we run, we try to go beyond, you know, the short-term viral wins and take it, link them to much more deeper systemic issues. So just as an example, um, a couple of years ago, there was an issue with the code of conduct at Pretoria Girls High School, among other schools, right? This became a hot topic, but at the heart of it was the notion that our education system does not consider black children to be children, right? The default idea of a child is a white child. And so we cannot be responding to these as isolated incidences, right? We have to be looking at there is a fundamental issue. How do we take the momentum with Pretoria Girls High School and make it something much more systemic as in all schools should have their code of conducts changed because clearly there is a much more deeper systemic problem. At no point do we think, it's so easy when you're trying to create a change in the world, right? To think of yourself or your organization as being at the center of the world. The reality is that we challenge challenging corporates, government, and many other forces that have so much more resources and so much more capacity. So in many ways, you're on the periphery of you know, the battle you're trying to fight. And with us, we believe that you know, nobody's sitting around waiting for an Amago.mobi to come along. So we see ourselves as how do we build up an ecosystem that through working collectively, we collectively move towards the center, right? So that's why we work a lot with partnerships, you know, people who are based and affected, people who are doing other forms of work in this space, um, which, which is very, very critical. And it's also recognizing that, you know, your organization or your institution, this isn't where it should be working. This isn't the biggest contribution it can make, right? In the ecosystem of people who are doing many other things, where do you fit in? How can you propel and amplify that work and push it forward? It 
it's not just about the campaign in the moment. In the lead up to launching campaign, there is a lot of narrative work to be done. I think two big examples of this is mental health and xenophobia. We live in a deeply xenophobic society. And I remember one of our campaigns um, around the refugee bill, for example, you know, some of the comments that we got were shocking and um, but they were deeply unsurprising as well, you know. You can bring forth um, all of the evidence you want. This is what research tells us. This is what research tells us. But there is a narrative battle, you know, that needs to be formed. So I think, yeah, there's a lot to be done in terms of changing and shifting narratives, not just in moments of campaigns, the language we use in other times as well.